Hello and welcome to Con Air, the podcast. I am Mark Margaritas on a yacht, Hoffmeyer. And I am Jay Origami Bird Cluett. And this is Con Air, the podcast, where we look at the 1997 Prisoners on a Plane masterpiece, Con Air, one chapter at a time. This is chapter three. What happens in chapter three of Con Air? Well, it's the time progression chapter. Cameron Poe is in prison, keeping his head down, doing the time. Passing it by exercise, learning Spanish, origami, sharing snacks with his new friend Babio, and predominantly writing letters to his wife Trisha and newborn daughter Casey. So we need a guest to help us talk about Con Air. Mark, who's joining us today? Uh, so return, well, not returning, but you, Nick DeSemlin, you joined us on Deep Lucy the podcast. Now you're back for more Con Air uh, shenanigans. So thank you for joining us. The editor of Empire Magazine. Yeah, well, you're very welcome. I'm happy to be here. Just to just to correct you slightly, it's Nick the Virus Assembly in. <laughs> of course, uh, sorry. It's uh, actually that doesn't work, does it? Unless it doesn't rhyme. Right. It rhymes with virus. But I'm gonna stick with it. I like that better because like I said uh, the first episode, I was Mark the capricious slaughter or Hoffmeyer because everyone would just hate saying that. Like I don't want to call him this nickname. Like why do I have to say this? So yeah, like. Nick the virus the semlin that's perfect it's like you don't need a rhyme yeah at all this is the affirmation i was i was hoping for so thank you yeah. for getting behind it i mean because it would be like a character in con air like coming up with a cool name for themselves and then no one wants to use it and they're just like oh there's fred <laughs> like, oh and fred 5000 <laughs> this, this, this movie has amazing character names it, it truly does I margaritas do on a yacht name. that's the good name right there people are like, what is this guy up to Guys, this guy's trouble. Just just Cameron Poe is such a great lead name. It's just a solid action hero lead. Cameron Poe. Cameron Poe. And he has really <laughs> great cellmates in this scene that we're talking about. He has the chillest cellmates I think I've ever seen in one of these movies. Guy reading a book, guy napping. I mean He's having a lovely time. Yeah. I mean this, this is like makes makes me want to go to prison. This this <laughs> yes. it's, it's just a great time. <laughs> You get these little pink coconut things. I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah, nice packages, Doritos, pull, like you know the the, the water um, the water pipes are strong enough to do pull ups from. Like this is, you know, that's funny you said that because I had the same exact feeling. I'm like, it's not bad in here. It's not it's not terrible. Well, you know? there there is the riot going on in in one of the scenes <laughs> when the prison is on fire. Uh, but he's like, I mean, he is not perturbed by that riot. Like, he's a very focused man. He's, I get distracted when I'm trying to write an article. I'm distracted by, you know, literally anything. I'm like a cat will just wander off. But yeah, Cameron Poe is is just in the zone. I, I want to see Tommy Lee Jones running by during this prison riot with uh, <laughs> like, what was he grabbing natural people's bone killers? Yeah, uh, just grabbing people's noses. People getting dunked in the fire. That'd be uh. You know, I bought that movie, Natural Born Killers, when I was t like 12 or 13 on a used VHS copy from Blockbuster, and it scarred me. It really did. I watched it way <laughs> too young. Just want everyone to know that. I can imagine Natural Born Killers and Con Air existing in the same universe. Like, it, it's got the same kind of energy. I can, I can see Tommy Lee Jones being like you know, one of the wardens on the plane, and I, yeah, I can see it. I can see it. Or uh, Australian Robert Downey Jr. recording everything, like fil filming it as a documentary. Uh, yeah, that could be fun. I was trying to blend together the names, but I couldn't. Con, wait, Con Air, Airborne? Oh, Con Airborne. Natural Airborne Killers, yeah. Natural Airborne <laughs> Killers. This has to happen. It's going to happen. For, thanks for that assist there, Jay. I was, I was lost there. <laughs> No, but like, oh, you know, watching this movie in '97, I I knew I knew Nick Cage from from The Rock, and that was a really cool performance. But he still wasn't the action hero yet. So then watching him doing these pull ups and push ups in Con Air was kind of revelatory to me because in in Kiss of Death he kind of beefed up, but I was used to kind of skinny raising Arizona, leaving Las Vegas, Nick Cage. So when I was 15, seeing Nick Cage doing all this stuff, I'm like, this dude's a beast. I don't know. Did you did you have that experience at all? 
I'm glad you've seen Kiss of Death because not many people have seen Kiss of Death. David Caruso, right, as yeah. well. But he is, you're right, beef beef is the word like he is a big unit in that film like he's it's like the biggest nick cage you'll ever see yeah. um so i guess it wasn't a total shock but it, yeah i mean this was a revelation to me as well i have a really strong i don't have strong memories of seeing a lot of films from that far back but connor i saw in bath where i went to school and um we were a bunch of us were drinking cider and then we went to see connor in like the afternoon like a saturday afternoon it's a bit of a cliche drinking cider in like in Bath, but um, yeah. the West Country. But um, yeah, I, I really remember seeing this for the first time and the, all of it, but especially just Cage's performance, just amazing. Yeah. Like instantly a favorite film. So, and where, where do you rank this? Face Off, The Rock, Con Air. What would you put one, two, and three? Because <sighs> you spend you've been spending a lot of time with action films, maybe in the eighties, I know, but probably some in the nineties. So what, what's like? How would you rank the Cage Prison Trilogy or the Cage Beige Volvo Trilogy? <laughs> <laughs> this That's a really hard one. That's a really hard one. We had this debate in the Empire office all the time and, you know, normally ends up with James Dyer just screaming lines from The Rock, um, <laughs> going full Hummel on us. Um, I do, oh, Honestly, out of the three of them, the one that I most often pop on is Face Off. Yeah. There's something about Face Off that, I mean, I love Connor and The Rock is almost perfect, but Face Off is the one for me. I love everything about it, probably because it's the craziest. Oh, yeah. It's it just is completely insane and it shouldn't exist. Um, and the, why is there a sci fi prison in the middle of this film? Um, the Rock is, you know, maybe The Rock is technically the best out of all of them. Maybe that feels like the most kind of probably the best film. It's the only one to have the Criterion edition. Yeah. But yeah, I have a lot of fondness for Conair, so I'm not going to answer this question. It's going to stonewall. Uh, that's fair. That's your, fair. Your, your magazine Empire did do a, a ranking of all the Nick Cage films recently as a podcast episode about it, where Conair is seventh on that list, and and The Rock is number one. Ooh. So, so you're you're backed up by your colleagues. I mean, even the yeah, like, even... I was part of that voting process, so I, I apologize. No, no, it's all, not at all. Even the background uh, actors in the rock are on fire. Like Bokeem Woodbine is shining in the background of some scenes, and like every, like uh, everyone's crushing it. I mean, we think the cast of Conair is impressive. The cast of The Rock is insane. It's ridiculous. So. And also, uh, I just want to bring some up, Nick. I want to thank you because during the Deep Blue Sea the podcast episode, you brought up how you were you were trying to make a Conair seating chart, and so when I heard y'all say say that, you're like, yeah, was, you're like it was really tough. Like we didn't get like we didn't get it quite 100 percent, so i was like i'm gonna do it i'm gonna go on a quest and it took me a long time it uh i was i was scanning every seat there's one guy named ramirez and i had no idea who it was so i just started mm. tweeting or emailing the actors from the movie or stunt, stunt crew from the movie and ty granderson wow. jones got back to me and he told me the guy's name and ramirez so i was able to complete the conair seating chart but it got some really good love around the internet and so you inspired me to go on a crazy Con Air mission where I was staring, I was like standing next to my TV, probably like 12 inches away, <laughs> pausing it, trying to like look at squinting, looking at eyes, staring at IMDb. So you sent me down a really fun journey that kicked off this podcast. So you you inspired me. <laughs> I'm really happy to hear that because I'm sure you did a better job. Like I remember sitting in the office, like trying to figure it out. And it, it's not easy, is it? Like it's uh, you went the extra mile, but there aren't like clear shots. Now, do, do you think it all hangs together? Is it coherent? Because I was when I was trying to do it, I was thinking I'm sure they're moving some of the people around like from shot to shot. But do you think it is consistent? Yeah, I think it is because you have two different sections. You have the first group and then um, they take some people off and then they bring in more people. So then you, I had to do two seating charts. And then they get off um, in what Castle desert, City. yeah. And then, like, you get some deaths. You never see Ramirez. Ramirez just disappears. So then you see him in a couple shots. And then they sit back down again. So I almost did about three seating charts for this, but it, it works except for Ramirez, which like drove me crazy. Um, Ramirez, yeah. that guy. <laughs> Take <laughs> that guy. somewhere still today. But it was fun because it's always fun when you're like, I can do this. This will be easy. And then you're like, this is not easy. This was. Yeah. Uh, oh. I did a lot of squinting at the... Uh, it almost, yeah, yeah, it almost drove me crazy. You know, I grew my hair out into a mullet. I started wearing, like, a white <laughs> wife beater vest. Um, no, I have full respect for you because I, I know from experience that is not an easy task. Oh, that's why you were doing all those push-ups that last time we <laughs> saw you. <laughs> two push-ups, two whole push-ups, yeah. <laughs> Took ages. But, like, when we cut to you, you're like, 301, 
three hundred and two. <laughs> no way. Stopped. Yeah. <laughs> I do them in installments, like two a year. <laughs> That's, that works. I like it. Like it's the same I want to see a Ramirez. Yeah. I want to see a Ramirez spirit spinoff. I'm now a bit obsessed with this character. Yeah. Right. Like let's uh, they because they all all these criminals in this movie they aren't like Cyrus the virus level. They're not Johnny twenty three or or Willie sixty six sixty three thousand. Um, <laughs> they just kind of people getting moved, right? They're not the. Are they the worst of the worst? I mean, they're heading to some kind of maximum security the prison. prison. That's, that's that's the kind of prison you would need for Cyrus the Virus and Garland Green. So the fact that like Babio is going there is always pose the question like, how bad is this guy <laughs> that is like our hero's friend? Uh, but we'll answer, we'll we'll cover that later. I think we'll dig into Babio. But... I mean, Babio's a good guy. In the in the uncut version of this, during the scene we're talking about today, he saves Cameron Poe during yeah, the, the riot. Fire, the riot. Fire. He comes yeah. in and saves him, and then he has burns later on his arm, and they never talk about it. Hmm. That's kind of nice. Well, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think they they cut that out because they wanted to keep like Cameron being the hero. If if they had Babyo save him, they'd be like, "Oh, Cameron owes this guy a debt." He's like Chewy. Like he don't he he like owes Babyo his life, but without that scene, Babyo owes him <laughs> for just yeah. snowballs and insulin. I wonder if the burns are a deleted scene. Like that's an interesting detail to just put in there without there being any explanation. I wonder if maybe he was cooking up some marshmallows or I don't know. <laughs> what trying to make his own doing? snowballs. Yeah. <laughs> trying to make his own prison snowballs. That'd be amazing. Yeah, desiccate coconut in a prison. <laughs> I want to be the librarian in a prison now. Cause imagine all the free stuff you get for just dropping off books. Like you're set. <laughs> The black market <laughs> trade for snowballs. Yeah, well, uh, Baby was doing the mop in the floor, isn't he? So I think a- any of the jobs to get you out of the cells, you can just go get free. Like, is he friends with everyone? Does he get treats the whole way along? Is this where the diabetes has come from? Maybe. All, all the snacks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just a good time in that prison. It's just a good time. I'm so glad you thought. Like, I know we were going back to this, but he has a CD player. He has a TV. I've never been in prison, but it, he's just doing his origami. He's leaving his light on at night. His roommate doesn't complain. Like he's, he, he's getting a ton of posts. I mean, he gets more posts than I get. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> like, I'm quite envious of that. Um, he's got his, like, wall, he's got stuff up on the walls. Like, so it's just uh, yeah. it's a great little cozy little cell. And it evolves over time, too. Like, uh, in the first shots, there's nothing on his bathroom little wall that separates him. And then you cut to it later, and there's a ton of trucks on it, like four-wheelers. And then there's all of that. And I was looking up the the, uh, the prop department, and Deborah Eckhard, who, like, was uh, the part of the prop team, she also worked on Deep Blue Sea. So she was, like, the set designer. So she, we got to get a hold of her, get her on the show. <laughs> we can hear her. Did you see the the... the like painting on his wall in this scene did you see what it said so it's no i I was trying i was trying to work out what it said i couldn't work it out it it says uh jesus christ was a black man without green eyes so f you (laughs) makes perfect sense did he draw that (laughs) it's an unusual detail yeah well there's there's two bits of artwork that are like that have when I first saw it, I thought it was like a king or a jester or something, but with the eyes scratched out. So this is a repeated thing that he keeps drawing. He's in, uh, he's or or Casey thing. keeps drawing and sending to him. There's a bit of a Jesus motif, because uh, there's like a postcard of Jesus. Not a postcard, that would be weird. But there's like a little drawing of uh, Jesus holding a sheep yeah. in one of the shots, which um, has a very similar haircut to uh, to Cameron Poe. I wonder oh. if there's, that was a deliberate parallel. Um, although he doesn't hold a sheep, he holds a bunny, but oh no, I just want to... that's all he could get. I wish yeah. he had a stuffed yeah. sheep in this movie <laughs> and the parallels were that all like, you know, the end of face off when Travolta has his arms open and gets speared like, like, uh, like oh. a crucifixion. If you have cage doing that with the hair, I mean, he is, mm. well, you know what though? You know what I like about him in this movie is he's not, ho- he's not too whole, like holier than thou. Like he does kill those guys in the beginning. He, he could have disarmed him, and he's really sassy throughout the movie. So it's a very, he, you can tell he is kind of a, like he used to be, he used to run amok around his town and cause problems. Like this is a guy with an anger issue, and I, I, I've, I haven't seen many heroes like that where he's just, he's just mouthing out to everybody. He's not really afraid, but he's super nice. 
but he's also sassy. Like I think it's a it's a really good performance by Cage. I didn't really pick up on until the Con Air seating chart watch because I stared at the screen so many times. But he's he's going at people. I like that about him in this role. I think people kind of dismiss it just because of the accent, which ah. isn't isn't bad. I like it, uh, but just the like the way he pronounces however and forever in this like in this scene alone is uh, almost comical because uh, it's just yeah it's, it's the the southern accent. But Mark, you're from the south. You don't speak like this. Uh, so. No, yeah. Well, I'm from Florida. You got to go south. You no, know, you got to go north to get that the southern accent. Yeah, of course. Because Florida's like a hybrid, and I'm in Atlanta now. But, I mean, listen, you go to, like, Alabama, like, there's about eight different dialects in Alabama. So, uh, it's 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 better than Benedict, Cum- Benedict Cumberbatch's accent in the Mauritanian. <laughs> did you ever hear, did you ever watch that movie? Mm, I haven't seen that one. I remember going, is he a good actor after listening to this accent? <laughs> so so everything, everything after that, I'm like, oh, it's fine. He's He's a great actor playing English characters. Yeah. But it's South Carolina accent, because oh, this is bad. But South Carolina is more sing-songy. It's not as harsh as Alabama. So, but he he kind of went like full foghorn leghorn. Like I say, I say. Uh. Wow, what a. <laughs> but I think this is a cla- this is a classic Nick Cage just wants to be left alone movie. Like I saw Red Rock West again recently, and it's just like I love a Nick Cage performance where he's just like a dude just trying to get from point A to point B and everyone is annoying him and getting in his way and everything's getting complicated. <laughs> he just wants to sit on that plane and do his origami and uh, paint pictures of Jesus or whatever he, whatever his hobbies are. Uh, but he's um, he's getting hassled and uh, you just want him to have a nice day. He does keep getting hassled. You're right. He shows up to the bar on the boat, gets hassled, gets on the plane, gets hassled, lands in Vegas, goes on a fire truck chase, gets hassled. That's like Willy's Wonderland, too. He's just driving along, and he gets hassled. Yeah. And Mandy. Yeah. Stop hassling Nick Cage, everyone. I think you just influenced another data post. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't want to come back for Mandy scene by scene. Oh, we need to do a chart. <laughs> a Mandy seating chart. I don't think anyone sits down <laughs> in Mandy at any point. <laughs> Seems to be too busy to chainsaw dueling. The Cenobites, like, where, what's their, like, how much blow do they have in their house? Like, that's the, the research I'll do. I saw the movie in a theater, and I got very lucky, and that's a quite a sensory blasting experience. I love that. Chainsaw fights. Oh, I saw it at nine in the morning, and I, I haven't recovered yet. It was <laughs> it's something that, yeah, that I saw Greasy Strangler once in the morning at 9 a.m. There's something about if I, see, if I have to see a movie, like, uh, first thing in the morning, I just know it's going to be traumatic and horrible, because they always put them on first thing, screening-wise. But yeah, Mandy, Mandy was a, a, a tough watch. I don't know. I don't know if I'd watch that one again. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a tough 9 am or Like, Requiem for a Dream, that's a tough 9 am or Irreversible. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I did Holy I, Motors I, at 7.30 a.m. In, in Cannes once, and that was that was uh, upsetting. I watched uh, Salo at 9 a.m. Oh. Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> like, uh, this is the, I, I'll try to watch all the films on the 1,001 Movies You Must See Before You Die list. I'm like, this is a film to watch when my wife is not home. Uh, so, she, like, she was at the gym. I thought, oh, I'll watch Salo now. <laughs> this is the window. That was a... Uh, that's a mistake. That's not a film to ever watch, let alone first thing on a Saturday morning. Yeah, never before lunch. <laughs> yeah, or during. Yeah, noted. I'm working my way through that same list. That one I haven't got. That's probably going to be the last one. I mean, that title is has... not welcoming. It's not. Yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not. Yeah, inviting. There's a, a few I'd recommend skipping in that book. <laughs> That's are, just one of them. Are Deep Blue Sea or Con Air in the book? Sadly, no. Yet, not yet. They do issues every year, so uh, there's still the, time. Um, <laughs> I think on the 10th anniversary of it, they they did a whole uh, they like kicked 50 films out throughout the book and replaced them with 50 new ones. So who knows? Wait, and you're trying to get through it, and they adapt, like change each year? Yeah, so I, I keep adding the, I, my, the list is now like 1,200 movies if you add all the editions together. It's a it, it, it's a Sisyphean task uh, that I wouldn't recommend. I like your style, Jay. And also too, I I so I I. We sent you an email, uh, Nick, and there's zero chance that you had a, a chance to wa- watch every single clip of pull-ups and chin-ups ever. <laughs> but I want to ask you, since you, you once again, you watch a lot of action movies, like you watch a lot of movies, if you're doing like a Mount Rushmore of mm. chin-up scenes, which four chin-up scenes would you pick? Or pull-ups, pull-ups, chin-ups, any of the ups in any Ooh. movie. <laughs> and I know I'm putting you on the spot. 
but yeah I, unfortunately i i didn't get through the full list of, of chin-ups as i was too busy doing chin-ups myself so i <laughs> it was, it's, a hard, it's a hard routine i don't have a lot of minutes in the day when i'm not doing chin-ups um, so number one on the list is you the recording of this podcast right now whilst you're doing chin-ups okay That's so this awesome. is kind of off the top of my this is kind of off the top of my head That's but fine. i'm gonna number Number one, I, I number one, I'm going to say Vasquez in Aliens. I should do it number yeah, four yeah. to one, yeah. but I'm just going to say them as they occur to I like me. Your so, style, yeah, yeah, Vasquez in Aliens. Uh, that's a hell of a character introduction, and um, that's just awesome. I don't have I don't have a lot of profound thoughts on it beyond I love um, Jeanette Goldstein in that role. She now sells bras. Um, hmm. In I mean, from its store in LA she's yeah. <laughs> out on the street uh, I thought she started a bridge. line of bras or something like that she's yeah sweet. yeah oh nice she makes her, she makes her um, but she's, near dark she's amazing too. she's great in everything yeah I love near dark I have near dark right next to my TV I haven't seen it for like 10 years and that's gonna be like probably the next thing I watch um, which I can't wait for it's really hard to find anyway that's that's unrelated um, <laughs> no, no pull ups in near dark <sighs> other great chin ups I'm sorry, Mark. I'm gonna find your email and and then yeah. I'm gonna choose from I'll the list. I'll share mine real quick. I'll I'll let everyone. Okay. I'll let the. I know the world's been waiting for mine. Uh, number one, cool runnings, just four people doing them, and then you get John Candy helping, um, Dougie Doug do them, and he's like, you're gonna have to do these on your own eventually. It's a beautiful line. I think Taxi Driver, just great, great indoor. Like it shows what you can do at home. You have a gym in Cool Runnings. You have home in Taxi Driver. A Terminator Two. She's in a like a facility, so that's yeah. epic. And I'm not gonna give it to Ben Affleck because he tries too hard. I'll give it to <laughs> I'll give it to Rocky Four. Barn. Okay. I picked four different locations. Barn barn pull ups, chin ups from Sylvester Stallone. So four different locations that showcase the the what what is it? How um you can do do them anywhere, which you know, Nick, because you're doing them now on the train. <laughs> if you're talking about locations doing it anywhere, then I gotta throw some off a tenant. Like oh, yeah. doing them up, up a ladder in a on a wind turbine out in the sea <laughs> is if you want to do it anywhere. That's anywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's legit. I don't know if I'm a big fan of that 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 shot. <laughs> I think it's quite silly. <laughs> it's very silly. <laughs> and he doesn't really do anything that character that requires upper body strength. Does Not he? I, in my memory, he just sort of walks around looking cool in a suit. He does some um, fighting now and then. But, well, they they uh, help him look cool in suits. Yeah, you yeah. got to fill that thing in. I mean, he he wields a cheese grater like anyone. In 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 that film, that's my favorite cheese grater fight. Wait, is that a kitchen fight? Yeah, it's a kitchen it's a kitchen fight at Tenet where he grates somebody's face with a cheese grater. It's incredible. That's true. Yeah. Well, that's I got to add that to my one thousand and one yeah. kitchen fights to watch before. <laughs> Before you die, <laughs> before you get hit in the face by a cheese grater and die. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm with you on Rocky Four. That's like a kind of rustic chin-up. I yeah. <laughs> and it shows he's old school. Like, you're not going to get Drago doing chin-ups. They're too primitive for him. He'll be like, have some kind of laser-guided <laughs> machine doing them for him. Pulling something um, down, right? He'll be doing chin-downs. <laughs> <laughs> they do those in Russia. <laughs> um, Electra, you've got Electra on the list. Um, One arm. Yeah, but it's not Jennifer Garner doing it. It's her face is in shadow. That annoyed me. <laughs> it's her, her, and then you had De Niro in, in Killing Season doing it, which of course he's not doing the chaps. No, in he Killing did season. him. He's seventy. No, no it doesn't. Uh, I, I have a friend. His face he, is in he, shadow. My friend was a sta his stand-in on it, and he told stories about how they asked him to do pull-ups, and he just knocked him out on set. Well, then the whoever lit that scene needs to be <laughs> <laughs> a talking to because his face is in shadow. It could be anyone doing that. De Niro, have you right? guys, have you guys seen Righteous Kill? No, uh, I, other, other, otherwise known as the film that he could have been. Um, <laughs> yes, this yes. is the this is the film that reunited uh, before the Irishman uh, reunited De Niro and Pacino. I went to the premiere and I remember it was oh, the, nice. the, they did a big thing, queuing up like we have Robert De Niro and Al Pacino here. Welcome to the stage and everyone starts clapping and they come on and they literally don't stop. They walk past the microphone. They come on stage from one side, walk past the microphone, go back down the other and just leave, immediately leave. Um, but I remember in Righteous Kill, as my memory serves from that one, I've only seen it the one time but I, there's a gym scene where de niro and pacino are like doing weights together in a gym and i'm certain that one of them puts weights down and they bounce <laughs> they're like fake movie props um 
I'm gonna, I don't want to watch it again to what? make sure no, it's, it's my memory of it. 1001! 1001! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 302. Um, so, yeah. Okay, has Pacino ever done chin-ups? So De Niro's done them. Oh, yeah, didn't he, in Devil's Advocate, didn't he monologue while doing chin-ups? I'm the devil! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He's doing a diabolical quantity of chin-ups. <laughs> Does the devil need to do chin-ups? I, 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 well, that's a great question. Does Keitel do them in uh, Little Nicky? I think Peter Cook does them in Bedazzled. Uh, you never see the devil working out in movies. <laughs> like, it's not, they never like have him like spotting someone in the chair. Like. Like, Tim Curry must have been doing something, but we never see it, right? Oh, he's buff. He's buff in that. He's got to be. A, he's got to have gym membership. Oh, he's just lifting his little goblins, doing curls. <laughs> <laughs> he's curling his imps. <laughs> Totten waits up to land on his horns. Oh man, that I want a training scene with uh, that now. Like Stan Winston, that would that would have been a beast to pull that off. Mm. Oh god, and yeah, Vigo does no push-ups in the the prophecy. He's just sitting around, kind of mumbling. Yeah, we need a devil workout movie. Yeah, <laughs> or he's got to like train for the for the end of the movie. But, <laughs> but yeah, I'd watch it. <laughs> just the same soundtrack of Rocky Four. Just Rocky Four. <laughs> <laughs> what, Rocky versus the devil. No. Like someone That's kills nice. his friend, you know. He's tr he's trying to bring Apollo Creed back from hell. Well, no, Payman. Payman from Hereditary gets killed, and then he has to join in, like train to go back to kill the person who killed Payman. This is gold. This is gold. Write this down because I want to see Rocky. Uh, how Rocky many goes to hell. Now? Rocky. Rocky seven. Yeah. <laughs> Rocky goes to hell. Rocky goes to hell. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and also, I gotta be careful here. Speaking of K Kaitel, I have notes here from Bad Lieutenant, and I keep blending them. I have on the same sheet of paper, and I keep blending my Bad Lieutenant notes with Con Air, and it's getting weird. Very different films. Very different films. Very different films. Rocky goes to hell. So in in this chapter, uh, <laughs> in, in the in the care package, she gets a an issue of Off Road magazine. I spent way too much time trying to find out what issue this was. There are. Loads of images online are different different covers of them, but a few of them were missing, and this is one of the ones that was missing, so I'm so frustrated. But he gets two care packages, both of them have an off-road magazine, and it's the same magazine in both packages. It's the same cover. So I just huh. had to point that out. Wow. Huh. <laughs> now, is that, a, is that a continuity error, or is that a character beat? That, I'd, like to think, a... I'd like to think he, he took pictures out of it to stick on his wall, and then asked, asked Trisha to send another one. Because he'd, he'd already desecrated this one to get the pictures. He wanted to, he forgot to read something on it before he cut it up. So can she send the same one again so we can read it? It's my theory. I like that. Or I wish she subscribed. I wish she, yeah. Oh, I wish Cameron Post subscribed to Empire. He'd, he'd get two copies of every issue. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> he'd have the subscribers copy. Yeah. yeah. Baby O probably uh, wanted that. He's like, that's a good issue. Can I have one? So then he had it send him in. Get I want a picture of that Bronco on my wall too. <laughs> I like the... <laughs> Does Cameron Post? I guess he does seem like a guy who puts trucks on his walls. I mean, he is. A, he absolutely is. He has done it in this chapter. Yeah, I wish I could have been in the like the the prop department, picking these pictures for the trucks. Okay, like I, I don't know. Maybe put a bunch of Honda Civics in there. Just something to throw people off. They did sneak that picture in though with the uh, that random artwork about Jesus Christ was a black man without yeah. green eyes. Some strange, some strange stuff going on. And did you guys notice, like, one of the pictures of his young daughter? She's eating a lot of carrots. I think. Am I, am I, am I misinterpreting this? I was, I was just freeze froze on the the image, but I'm sure she's holding a carrot, and there's like a big bag of carrots next to her. Yeah, I think you're right. It's either a bag of carrots or a, a bag of flowers, but I think it's carrots. Uh, either way, yeah. That's, I mean, they're, they're they're good pictures. I think they are. I think they are all of the the actual little girl. Uh, Landy Albright plays Casey. Mm. So I think these are all photos of, Kate, of Landy Albright. Uh, so they would have just picked through her family photos to see what fits. They get a good selection. And the lighting's really nice in this prison. She is wearing the, the, the young girl is wearing the same outfit in all six pictures that I can see. Like She seems to be wearing the same costume. They don't seem to have like put her in different outfits to try and denote the passing of time. It's just they did one yeah. photo shoot. 
<laughs> they have it for one day. Yeah. yeah. You've got one hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> make the use of it. Um, did you guys notice the detail? With the, talking of the, the, magazine, the magazine arriving twice. So they have a shot of the dice at the beginning and the end. Did you guys pick up on that? It's seven. Right? The six seven. and the one? The number seven. Yeah. But also just the fact they haven't moved. No. Like, it's they're just in the same position, so it's like years have passed. <laughs> Why are they there? He's super organized, but yeah, same exact spot. This, it's this on the same book, yeah. Uh, I did notice that. I'm like, this guy. This is a, uh, yeah, I love it. But I, maybe it's maybe it's like a, to show that he's not into gambling. He's a, he's strong willed. He's not gonna gamble. Presumably, gambling goes on there. I don't know why he's got dice. Otherwise, maybe he's got it, you know. Yeah, he's got he's got cards, but he's playing solitaire with them, or or I think he's, I think he's playing free cell, uh, on on his desk. I'm sure that's not the actual game, but it looks like the free cell layout. Imagine uh, another movie like Once Bitten. Once Bitten, or is that the Jim Carrey movie? That's Jim Carrey. What's Vampire's Kiss? Vampire's like if his Kiss, character yeah. was in prison, he'd be rolling dice constantly. Yeah, just screaming up and down. That that'd be a really interesting up montage for sure. <laughs> Te- no. Teaching, uh, teaching Casey the alphabet in her letters. <laughs> there are so many interesting Wait, production see. design choices being made in this, just in this one little bit. Like I have so many questions, and none of them are, you know, none of them could be answered really. But um, it's certainly raising a lot of uh, a lot of questions. What do you think he listens to? Because he has CDs there. Well, yeah, he has his Spanish oh, cassette yeah. that he listens to. He's uh, using his well in there. Yeah, I. I had hoped that like, he learns Spanish, he learns origami in this chapter. I kind of wanted them to come up later in the film, like as a flashback to, oh, my time in prison was spent bettering myself to help me get out of the situation. Like when he's later, he has to talk to, to Sindino and his men. He could have done that in Spanish. He could have left some kind of origami message for Larkin somehow on, on Pimble's body. <laughs> like in Blade Runner, right? Like he like could have done an Edward yeah. James Olmos and, and just left little origami things for people Absolutely. as a now, calling card. As a kid, I did a lot of origami. Uh, this was almost a calling card of mine. I, when I, I lived in London for a year, and I would always fold the tube map into a pig and leave it on every tube that went on. So I had my own little calling card. Uh, and a few years ago, when the Blade Runner 2049 came out, I was approached by a different film magazine that wasn't Empire, but was the other one in the UK, whose name we won't talk about, uh, which is it's lesser than Empire. So it's, you know, Empire. I have no idea. No idea what you're talking no, about. No, no one knows. Uh, but they wanted to do a feature of how to fold an origami unicorn. And my wife works for a, a craft company. So they went to her and then she came to me. And I'm in this magazine uh, teaching how to do fold an origami unicorn. And they wanted a video for it. So the only day that we could record this video was on my 30th birthday uh, in a really hot office where I was told I wouldn't have to speak or be on camera, just my hands folding it. But I got there and that was not the case. I had to introduce myself. I had to... In a room full, like a full room of people who are sat working in silence, I was at the other end of it being filmed, just talking. And it took so long to do because I kept screwing up. And this video is on YouTube. And uh, should, <laughs> it, I need to live by the, the idiom of don't read the comments because they are not kind <laughs> to, to me and the origami that I'm doing. Uh, it's, there's, there's comments saying like it's better with the sound off because you're not really talking. <laughs> Uh, like, so they they introduced me as being an origami expert, which is not the case. I am a hobbyist <laughs> at best. And but the the, fold, the the unicorn isn't an easy one to do, so I had to do it in a way that uh, people who, who like laymen could do, like first times origami could do it. So it involved two pieces of paper that you cut and you stick together in various places. So all the comments are like, oh, some origami expert had to use scissors and tape for this one. Uh, someone will retire you for this. Is my, <laughs> my favorite comment on that. Um, so you had some like some really hardcore origami experts like coming on and burning you. Like, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, I was just this guy who happened to know some origami, found a model of how to do it online somewhere, and just did that on camera. This uh, guy's like some guys like I I make origami with my toes. This yeah. guy amateur. <laughs> uh, so I just that's my origami story I have to bring in for this relevant chapter. It sounds yeah. traumatic. Right, right. Sounds but he, traumatic. He, the, the bird that he made is is the traditional flapping bird. It is one of the most common origami folds you can do. It would have been near the front of that book that he got, and it's it's uh, the one of the few interactive bits. You can kind of hold it and pull the tail, and it flaps its wings. So it's it's a simple one to do. Uh, it's a standard bird fold, uh, but he does it well. It's a nice one. I like it. 
I love origami in films. I'm not a huge fan of Blade Runner uh, for my sins, uh, but <laughs> even less so after this experience that I had. Mm. I wonder if that, that is, is that Cage who actually made that? Do you think you don't actually see him making it, do you? He just kind of holds it. He just holds it and, and pulls the tail to make it flap. But it's not a difficult one to have done, so he absolutely could have done it. I mean, Cage can do anything, so he could have done it with his eyes shut. First time, he probably invented it. Do you think he would allow that? Because he got down to, what, 3% body fat for this. And he trained with uh, John Cusack's uh, Benny the Jet, the kickboxing champion, to get in strength, like in, in shape. So, I mean, I wonder if he, he would make it, wouldn't he? I mean, he would have done that whilst doing push-ups, I think. Just And, and chin-ups. Like, yeah. Every, like, yeah, he'd, like, push himself up enough to get his hands up, do a fold, land. Another push-up, <laughs> up, fold, land. Like Zohan. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and when you would have, he, later on, he folds up Swamp Thing like origami, like Zohan does <laughs> as well. <laughs> There's no jet ski action scenes, though, in this movie. Otherwise, it would just, I would be able to mention Zohan again. Yeah, we, we needed, instead of it being a fire truck chase, uh, Cyrus and, and Coach, like, steal a boat. <laughs> so then uh, uh, Larkin and Poe can jump on jet skis. That's, what, that's mm. the only way to improve Connor. You get that in Face Off. Face Off, face off delivers on yeah. the speed yeah. I love a good boat fight. Like, there's always two unattended speedboats just sitting outside a church. It's just, that's where you find them. Like, hey! Just pop out, pop just out of the dogs. church just on a speedboat. Dogs. You're off. Oh, I love it. Hey, I have a question, uh, Nick. When when you watch this movie, do you often forget that there's a fire truck chase at the end? <laughs> I don't actually, no. I, it, it's like the speedboat chase in Face Off. I love an action movie where you think it's finished. It should, by all rights, finish, and then they just throw in an extraneous <laughs> chase for no reason. And this is one of my favorites. It's so stupid. Uh, no, I love it. I love it. It's actually, uh, I'm trying to think what the, uh, I should know this. Uh, what's the Roger Moore Bond film that has the fire truck chase in Vegas? I can't remember because I did it. I watched all the Bond films in a row once and it's blended all of them in my head. So I may be, I may be, I'm misremembering this. Give me one second. I, I do love though, uh, during this fire truck chase, you get a shot of Cusack and Cage taking off. And at that moment, the guy from Say Anything and the guy from Raising Arizona are chasing after the guy from In the Line of Fire on motorcycles with the dude from Pulp Fiction there. Like, it's such a... It's a I, uh, I never remember that moment, but it just makes me so happy to see that. But yeah, the, the train scene in Speed, I rarely remember. Yeah, that, that's the one I always forget, is the end of, the end of Speed. Yeah. And I just got it's reminded of the boat chase, too, in Face Off. This random... It, yeah. A View to a Kill it's, has the fire truck chase. View to a Kill, yeah, yeah. I just looked it up. It's not Vegas, it's San Francisco, so it's not too far away. But they, I wonder if that inspired this in some way. Oh. Roger Moore kind of hanging off the back of a fire truck. It's pretty cool, actually. Like, I, I, I quite like View to a Kill. It gets much maligned, um, but it's better than Tenet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> better than Tenet? <laughs> it's got Christopher Walken, it's got a blimp, It's uh, it's got a fire truck chase. It's got Roger Moore being really old. Um, well, it's not true. like it's Grace Jones <laughs> being a maniac. It's it's a good time. Isn't the person in the beginning full? Like, who's the person in the beginning on what is it, the Eiffel Tower? They have some art. What, what was? Who's that person in the beginning? Are they folding stuff up? Am there's I a making butter, things? It's like a butterfly art piece in in, in it. Is that what they're doing? It's like a butterfly art performance. Yeah. Okay. That's what some... it is. Yeah, that's what they're doing. I don't know how <laughs> I got pretty... origami with that. <laughs> There could be origami in there as well. I, 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 it's been a while since I saw a view to a kill. And the chase uh, is in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, because they're they're, they're um, at Silicon Valley, aren't they? So it's in that kind of area. Do you know what the world needs more of? Chris Walken as Bond villains. Uphill chases in San Francisco. Uphill ch- <laughs> because bullet downhill, The mm. Rock downhill. Mm. So many downhill chase. I want an uphill chase. Just a car chase where they're all in like first gear and like manual yeah. cars, just like <laughs> come on, straight, a, a straight straight chase where they're just the panting the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, well, I don't, I've never seen an uphill chase in San Francisco. The chase in Nark, but it's all uphill. <laughs> oh man, yeah, please. I don't know. You, can, Rennie Harlan would do that. Rennie Harlan does a lot of like he adds a lot of extra things to his films that you don't expect. So oh, there's, there's a bit in twelve rounds. It's downhill. That's that's San Francisco as well. That's San Francisco. I just no. saw. I just saw what's up, Doc. Really? That's got a killer San Francisco car chase. I, I can't remember whether it has an uphill bit, but it might because it's kind of a comedy, bit of a comedy chase. I need to go watch that. What's up, Doc? 
What's up, Doc? Yeah, I, I watched it when Peter Bogdanovich passed away. It's, it's a good movie. All right, I might be proven wrong. I might have a new favorite film. I can't use that bit anymore. Then that'll that'll be a bummer. <laughs> 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 no, but um, hey, what else is on here? First instant. We talked about his roommate. She's pretty. That guy's pretty chill. That was a, twelve rounds in New Orleans. My mistake. Yeah, that's on the train. Yeah, that's With why I see it in San Francisco. Yeah, I got it. Have you seen Twelve Rounds, Nick? I did. I did. It's Rennie Harlan, right? Yeah, it is. And John talking, Cena. Deep, talking yeah. of Deep Blue Sea, yeah, I did a movie mastermind quiz with Rennie Harlan once, oh. and um, I asked him. I can't remember now the question. I did. Let me try and dig up the questions. But um, I asked him like trivia questions on each of his films, and um, yeah, I watched Twelve Rounds. It, to be honest, it hasn't left a huge impact. <laughs> um, no, I mean it's it started with a vengeance and speed, but starring John Cena, and we have those other two films already. It's fun. It's fun enough. Yeah, I'm uh, looking forward but, to it. How is Rennie? He's he's cool. Yeah, very friendly guy. Very friendly guy. I actually interviewed him for uh, my new book, which is about like 80, 80s and 90s action. So um, I'm trying to remember what it was now, but it was it, uh, it was um, late 2020, I'm going to say. It was I had to do it incredibly early. He's like a real morning person. And he was he he. I talked to him for like an hour and a half, and then at the end he went, you know, I'd been on a treadmill this whole time. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> like, he was I, he was almost certainly doing chin ups. He's an energetic guy, but he I, it was I got up at like half five in the morning, and he was in Finland, so he was even earlier for him. But he was at the gym. He was having a great time. Um, but yeah, we talked about uh, Die Hard Two, and a few other things. And uh, yeah, he said he wants to do another Deep Blue Sea, and he asked me if I thought it was a good idea, and I said yes, it's a very good idea. We would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why not do it? That'd be that'd be awesome. I've I've spent so much time listening to his commentaries. I feel like I know the guy, which is weird. <laughs> he's like open to talking about. You know, he's he's chilled on Cutthroat Island. He's he's a mellow guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like so, Cutthroat Island. Yeah, you, it's great. You can see he's the, got a great monkey. <laughs> you can just see the money on screen, which makes me happy. Like it's just they put boats out in the ocean, which makes me which makes me smile. Uh, so Nick, have you have you met or interviewed anybody involved with Conan? Um, I've met Nicolas Cage. Um, hey, I've actually need to go. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've, I've interviewed Nicolas Cage uh, a few times. Uh, he's very pleasant to talk to. Um, we talked last time. We talked about his entrance on Wogan, and um, which he kind of inspired his performance in in his new film, right? Unbearable weight of massive talent. He kind of based his uh, his sort of the you know the younger version of him that keeps popping up. Is, is basically Wogan, Nick Cage. Oh. Um, uh, Mark w- Wogan is Terry Wogan is the chat show in the UK. Yeah, and he comes out spin kicking. Oh, okay. Yeah, he comes out. Right. Okay. He, he does like uh, he does like a high kick. He gets money out of his pockets. He starts throwing money at the audience. It's it's one of the most incredible things you'll ever see. I highly recommend anyone listening who's not who's not seen Nicolas Cage on Terry Wogan. Yeah, I'd love it. I, I just assume everyone knows Wogan. I don't know why I would assume that. Um, and yeah, I, I've met him in person. The UK. Very ubiquitous. But yeah, and I've met Nicolas Cage in person once, and that was amazing because uh, James Dyer from Empire and I went along to talk to him for the Empire podcast, and we took along um, printouts of Nicolas Cage's Disney princesses. I don't know if you guys have seen, like, someone has created cartoon versions of Disney princesses all with Nicolas Cage's face, and this was like a meme. Uh, a while back, so we took those along to gauge his reaction to them, <laughs> which could have gone badly, in retrospect. But he was he was into them, he was enjoying them. Yeah, he's a genial guy. I've I've met John Malkovich. Um, I had a very strange experience meeting John Malkovich a long time ago now, but I went to Paris and he was promoting some kind of business venture. It wasn't a film. I can't remember what it was now, but um, I talked to him in a very strange hotel. You had to walk through all these drapes, like sort of a tunnel of drapes to get to him. And then at the end of the interview, I was presented with a John Malkovich party pack was what it was called. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a gift pack with a DVD of dangerous liaisons, uh, a, a mask of John Malkovich's face, okay. which I presume was some kind of being John Malkovich thing. And then a few other bits and bobs, but um, that was pretty weird. Amazing. Like the, the, <laughs> Like his people handed you that? Like the production company? What the marketing? Yeah, whoever was like his assistant or whoever was running the event. They were giving the journalists a, a sort of John Malkovich themed you know, gift bag. I love was, that. Uh, yeah. What would be in a Nick Cage gift bag? What, oh. what what D V D would be in the Nick Cage like, oh, next? Vampire's Kiss. He said that's his favorite that's performance, it. right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, fine. A cockroach. Um, 
a pink yeah. sort of fluffy whatever the hell this That's, thing is in this movie. Yeah, a snowball, yeah. Oh, a pink bunny. Pink bunny. Oh, oh pink bunny. Oh, okay. yeah. A spin kick guide. Yeah. Uh, John Travolta's face. I was going to uh, say a mask of John Travolta. <laughs> some, no, you could have... I mean, look, a Nicolas Cage like gift pack would be that box from Face Off, which has got all that stuff in. I mean, that would be perfect. I want that. Chicklets, guns, drugs. What else Bullets from Lord of War, maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I want the gift, the box from Face Off, and you get uh, to hang out with Cassavetes afterwards, and kind of chill. Yeah, oh, that's great. Let's see, do I have anything else? The, the, the entire chapter is set all in one room, so there's. <laughs> <laughs> think, it's a minimal, chapter. yeah, it's 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 a minimal one. Um, there's quite a strange shot of the prison at the start of this uh, chapter. Yeah, that's a model, isn't it? Doesn't look terribly real. I mean, it's real. Uh, yeah. it's quite odd. It kind of looks like uh, like a bit of the X, the X Files opening, you know, the, the credit sequence. It has a kind of slightly spooky vibe to it. it really, there's, there's lightning going on. Yeah, very unconvincing. I and mean, that's the most pleasant thing inside. So maybe they're just trying to mess with people. It looks horrible, but then it's pleasant. Except yeah, for the riots. Just, in time he's been walked down the corridor. Everyone's at their, their cell gates to greet him, uh, throw playing cards at him. And it's lovely. I wish I could have been that cop extra, or the cop who does the the extra looking walk next to across. He goes past Cage later on doing the extra walk. I want to be a cop in a Nick Cage movie. That'd be great. Is that the role? Like, if you guys were going to play a role in Connor, which one would you would you would you do that? <laughs> Maybe you can. I can expand on my role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> becomes like a buddy movie. I would be the guy in the beginning who like threatens him and then gets killed by Nick Cage. He'd be Kevin Gage. Because okay. I'd be the most, I, I'd be the most, I'd be the worst at that, and so everyone would just be like, "Who is this guy?" I, I think I could do as as his lawyer, his terrible, terrible lawyer we talked about last week. Who <laughs> just like, no, nah, you should like plead guilty. It'll be fine. Uh, he'll get like three years. Or the no, the guy when they when they get to the desert, there's the guy who's hiding in the in the radio tower. Who's like, oh, he's pissed himself or something. <laughs> <laughs> do it what well actually i would be a cop because i was a cop in following i was a goon in resurrection i was a peace keeper in hunger games so i would want to continue my like law enforcement agent thing so i would just be one of the people walking the guys to the prison just give me a brief scene where i don't have to act and that's it keep that rolling <laughs> yeah so yeah. i can keep my my cop thing going on so yeah uh, yeah just do that it's agent mark going on <laughs> <laughs> I've been nothing in anything, so uh, I would be on craft services. I don't know. Uh, just not, not in the. Just not like a dead character, because that that's horrible. I, I had to play a dead peacekeeper in Hunger Games, and I just got laid there in a really uncomfortable spot because my buddy was the AD. Second, it, second, second. So he like bent my leg back. I'd like turn my neck. So that by the time they were repelling, I was just like miserable for the thing. <laughs> And then uh, how, many jumped... take, how many takes did you have to do? Oh, there was a bunch. And then I had to run up. And so we had a bunch of baby PAs looking up the top 50 um, floors. So I was watching over at some of them. So I'd have to run upstairs with a cloak so no one could take pictures, watch over the baby PAs, come back down, play dead. They just needed an extra person. So they tossed me in. And so that's how I got like a bunch of my extra roles. But he was just laughing about it the whole time. Like other people just got to lay there and just like be comfortable. And he bent me up. My neck was cricking, but hey, it was fun. I yeah. got paid twice, so you not can't as, complain. Not as glamorous as, as it seems. I, the one time I was an extra, I just got hosed with water. And <laughs> unfortunately, I only had tape brought out. It was in New Orleans, and uh, I'd only taken out like one pair of jeans and one pair of shoes, and they were absolutely soaked. So I was quite miserable the next morning. <laughs> but that was for um, Jurassic World, though. So you're in... It was for Jurassic World, and you can just about see me, like if you pause and then go right up to the screen with your face. But... um. Yeah, I mean it was it was definitely worth it, but it was uh, you know, I suffered for my art as does, as did you. It was like my. Does anybody get hit with water here? We could continue your trend. The rain fight you oh, could be uh, in with me. We could be the two goons who get beat up by. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be goon too. <laughs> Happy to be um, sprayed with a hose <laughs> at length. <laughs> Keep the waterlogged thing going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I'm pretty good at being soggy. That's my forte. <laughs> it's just soggy characters. <laughs> The cinematic moist. Moist. I only play moist characters, very <laughs> damp characters. Brother. Uh, so uh, we we have con. I've been counting up how many cons we have in each chapter and how many of them are in the air for this film. So we have. I counted thirteen. 
13 cons in this chapter, which we've won so far when when Cameron Poe gets convicted, he's a con. But 13, and he's doing the chin-ups, he's in the air. We have a con in the air. Oh. We've got one, finally. Three chapters in it took to get a con in the air in this film. Thank you, chin-ups, pull-ups. Yep. Oh, that's amazing. He's easing himself up into high altitude. He's just like, <laughs> I'll start with like five inches off the floor. A little bit at a time, yeah. Listen, he, out for if he, he, if he did jumps six next pull-ups during that scene like they were nothing. Like, he, this guy got... They, they read, I read somewhere they was kind of being like a monk on set, just keeping in shape. And you could tell. Like, he he went all... I, I still remember that experience 15 years old, watching him do all that. I'm like, this dude's... Nick Cage is a beast now. He's not beefy. He's like a beast. So, it yeah. is a shame they, they don't show, like, the waist down. Because he's doing them with such ease, it looks like somebody's holding on to him, just kind of lifting him up and putting him down. <laughs> <laughs> he's so on someone's back. Yeah. Someone is like doing press ups and he's just standing on the guy's back. Oh, that's where his cellmate uh, is. I was going to say, such an amenable cellmate. They're just helping yeah. him with the, with the chin ups. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. When did we last get Beefy Cage? Like, when when was the last Beefy Cage performance? Mandy? Beefy. He's pretty beefy. That's true. Uh, he's got yeah. some beef on that. And then. I mean. Prisoners of Ghostland, he's skinnier. My testicles! Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Have you seen that movie? Uh, not, not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have, yeah, oh my bad. He something. No, I, I, I've heard about that scene because you've told me about that scene. Oh, it's beautiful, <laughs> and no one even talked about it. You know, he had a great year when no one talks about the scene where you know his testicles blow up. So, uh, yeah, I think Mandy Beefy Cage, Lumberjack yeah, Cage. Yeah, yeah. I have a theory that you should just put Cage in the woods because Joe, Mandy, Colorado yeah. Space. Uh, and there's one more that I'm missing. Pig. Just put him in the woods. Yeah. Good things yeah. happen. Forest Warrior. <laughs> it's a reference to a, ter a truly terrible Chuck Norris film. Forest <laughs> Warrior. Have you guys seen Forest Warrior? No, but no. I will now. I'm writing that <laughs> it's down. The one where Ch it's the one where Chuck Norris uh, dies and then comes back to life and he can change into different animals. And, um, oh, incredible. He can transform into... I can never remember the animals, even though I saw it pretty recently. But I, I think one of them's a hawk and one of them's a bear. And then there's something else that he... It's incredible. It's absolutely, and he, he's fighting evil lumberjacks. So maybe there could be a, you know, Mandy, Chuck Norris crossover. Yeah, because he kills trees in Joe, and then he he's a lumberjack in Mandy. So then him versus Chuck Norris is an animal. Oh, Nick Cage versus Chuck Norris is a film I would watch, even if it's not like not scripted, if it's just in a room. But directed by the guy who did Pig, and it's just like yeah, real sensitive. <laughs> and there's like, no action in it. Yeah. Because everyone's like, man, like, pig is going to be taken with the pig. And then it was just a beautiful experience. But then you get this one. You're like, Nick Cage is going to fight Chuck Norris as a forest animal? And then it's like, they just, it's just a nice, pleasant film. Yeah, they're just, just having a just, go, for a, go for a gentle stroll along the river. <laughs> it's like, it's like a, re, a secret remake to Before Sunset. Before Sunrise. <laughs> I was thinking about Dinner with Andre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mike Picnic with Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and truffles. <laughs> the pig. Yeah, they truffles, truffles and bacon. <laughs> what, wait, what, my picnic with Chuck? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can't beat that. That's that's awesome. <laughs> We're coming up with some good movie ideas there. I think we need to make some of these happen. I think Rocky, Rocky goes to hell. <laughs> Rocky as hell should already exist. I don't know why that hasn't come out yet. <laughs> the devil training montage. <laughs> I just, I'm just i sorry, I keep seeing them in my head, and then I stop talking on a podcast, which is not what you should do <laughs> at all. But I can see it. I, I can see these two movies. Oh, man. Wait, it could the pig, the pig in pig could have been Chuck. This is true. My God. No wonder he was sad. <laughs> well, you can't kill Chuck Norris, so they'd have to rewrite. Sorry if that's a spoiler. You can cut that out. But yeah. um, Arkin's like, we brought him back, and he and he just <laughs> beat the crap out of all of us. <laughs> just took off running. We didn't want to tell it's anybody because it's embarrassing. And Cage is like, I went through this whole journey. Oh, gosh. All right, well, we don't want to keep you too much longer, Nick. We know you got to get going, but uh, this was lovely, and thank you so much for joining us. 
Oh, it's been a joy to watch uh, Three Minutes of Con Air. There's never a bad time to do that. And it's a, it's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to talk about it with you guys. So thank you for having me on. Um, do you want to uh, uh, plug your upcoming book? Sure. Uh, yeah. I, well, um, or the ones you already have out. Uh, sure. I have a, a book out called Wild and Crazy Guys, um, which is about the uh, comedy stars of the 80s and 90s. And I, I kind of have a companion piece to that called uh, Last Action Heroes, which is out next summer. So I'm just uh, kind of doing the revisions on that at the moment. But that's uh, that's about your your action dudes. Uh, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, obviously, uh, Seagal, Van Damme, Chuck, as discussed, um, Jackie Chan, Dolph Lundgren. I think that's all of them. Bruce Willis as well. Can't forget Bruce. So, yeah, I've been I've been I've been deep into that world of, of people getting kicked in the face for a while. So, yeah, hopefully it's entertaining. I think I know how many front kicks Dolph Lundgren has thrown, thrown in his movies. So if you need that data, I think I can toss that your way. <laughs> Please send it over. <laughs> send over uh, your your findings. Yeah, I'll send yeah, you stupid Excel data for, foot, for footnotes. <laughs> I'll uh, send in some weird stuff. Stupid data is what I want, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm the king of that. I'm, I'm, I'm the king of that right there. I also figured out that the more splits JCVD does in a movie, the better critical scores, audience scores, and money his movies make as well. So there's like a split to critic ratio. Checks out. Checks yeah. out. I mean, the more splits he does, the better the film. So, I mean, why would the critics not recognize that? Yeah, Time Cop has like three or four. And that's like one of his more popular ones. Yeah, yeah Time Cop, he does the splits while he's opening the fridge. Like he's he does. making yeah. himself like a snack. I mean, we all do, I think. That's just how we make breakfast. <laughs> uh, well, uh, hey, yeah, if I find something, I'll, shoot, I'll, I'll send you a, a highly... Uh, yeah, no, I'll just send you some dumb data. Send it your way. Send me dumb, send dumb data. Definitely send dumb data. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just as a final like parting thing, like I would recommend that anyone who hasn't seen Sudden Death uh, watch Sudden Death because that is a great Van Damme film that I don't think gets talked about enough. So rewatching that, I was like, got to recommend this to everyone. That's no one so far. To take... Yeah, yeah, Powers Booth. Who is does um, the narration for Connor at the start? Yes, good link, good linkage. And he threatens to fill a child's mouth with spiders at one point. Oh, man. And there's a kitchen fight with a mascot. Yeah, it's a really good one. A really good kitchen fight. Oh, I feel like sudden death of the podcast is in our future. Uh, yeah, after daylight. <laughs> yes, after I, daylight. I, I love I, daylight. Yeah, watch sudden death. That's that's what I got to say. So, yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Well, uh, Mark, what have you got to plug? Uh, yeah, just uh, movie films and flicks, movie films on FLX. Check that out, the podcast and the website. And then um, I also work for Rotten Tomatoes. So watch Rotten Tomatoes versus video. Uh, let's see. I counted all the explosion in Michael Bay films. So go read that article on Rotten Tomatoes. And then go check out Film Theorist. Just type in Mark Hoffmeyer Film Theorist. And I got a crazy Tom Cruise video coming out for fandom soon. So that comes out when Top Gun hits streaming no top gun maverick it's streaming that video will come out so uh go to fandom it's a by the numbers and watch that excellent uh, as for me or deep blue see the podcast still exists it is now monthly rather than weekly so you can still hear me talking about uh deep blue sea adjacent films once a month uh so check that out that's films directed by Rennie harlan or featuring sharks or aquatic action uh so that's always fun i think our most recent episode is primal when this comes out because it's a crossover for between that and Connor. So Nick Cage on a boat with criminals and, and uh, animals. Chuck like, Norris. And that, yes, of course. So yes, yeah, <laughs> Chuck Norris is in primal somewhere. Uh, and life versus film.com is my personal site. And then I post a monthly episode on the lamb cast movie trivia for Lampity. So look out for that as well. Uh, but as for Connor chapter three, thank you very much, Nick Selman for joining us. Thank you guys for having me on. I'm going to go off and learn origami. Um, I'm going to watch your video, Jay, and oh, no. then make myself an origami Cameron Poe. And write comments. Uh, and write, yeah, go, go yeah. by the comments. It won't work. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I've, I've been Jay Clewis. I'm Mark Hoffmeyer. Uh, come back next week or the bunny gets it. Sigh. Anara. <laughs>